in, in 2008, a friend um, sent me a call for papers for last year's um, ICOMOS conference in Sydney, which was called Unloved Modern. This call arrived just as the momentum for the redevelopment of North Bank was coming to a climax. I live nearly opposite North Bank and work for the Queensland Government, but I was not involved in the project, nor did my employer, the Works Department, play any role, at least in the later stages of it. And I speak here entirely unofficially. Uh, <laughs> The primary justification given for North Bank, um, for the North Bank redevelopment, was to hide the Riverside Expressway. It was seen as so, as so offensive that almost any action to hide it and to absolve our collective guilt was justifiable, even against our best interests. I want to start with a familiar story, which in my childhood my parents and I found amusing. In brief, a spectator at a military parade turns to a bystander and says, everybody's out of step except my Johnny. And that was my position in 2008. I was out of step with North Bank in liking the Riverside Expressway, which definitely was unloved. And this... Oh, sorry, did I jump over one? Um, that's not me on the left, but I think it might be Anna Bly and Paul Lucas on the right. I don't know. From 2001 until 2008, it appeared inevitable that North Bank redevelopment would proceed. Neither the value nor effectiveness of the proposal of hiding the expressway was explored, nor was the considerable damage to the context, flood levels or to traffic. The central role of the expressway as an eyesore was taken as given. This paper places the Riverside Expressway in the context of transportation planning in Brisbane. It was built as part of stage one of the Brisbane Transportation Study of 1965, known as the Wilbur Smith Plan after its American consultant. Cons Critics see this plan as the ill-considered superimposition of a US-style freeway on Brisbane. The paper demonstrates that the free expressway was based on ideas that had evolved to overcome long-term problems of access to the city centre, difficulties that arose from the physical constraints of the city's site. Um, it was, um, the Riverside Expressway was only a partial solution in that only the western part of the scheme was built before inner city freeways were abandoned in the mid-1970s. In the absence of alternative ideas, the layout had much to recommend it, not least in extending the restricted city grid and improving access by means of mirrored expressways to the east and west, as well as a new road from the north the Wharf Street extension. The formal quality of the Riverside Expressway has been given little consideration. It was undertaken with skill and sophistication by planners and engineers within and as consultant to the Queensland Coordinator General and Main Roads Department. Their work has been unfairly denigrated. Despite its visual prominence, the layout of the expressway is unusually compact. Located on the edge of the CBD and devoid of access along its western side, the integration of the expressway with a system of one-way streets in couplets avoids the complex, extensive and often intrusive interchanges associated with freeways. The Brisbane Transportation Plan and the Riverside Expressway were carried out in the post-war era when confidence in planning for community benefit persisted, but by the, the mid-1970s the emphasis had changed from problem-solving to avoiding impacts. Declining funds and increasing community concern about the negative impacts of urban freeways led to the plan being deferred at least in and near the CBD. Further out, implementation continued. And 40 years later, the opportunity to make such substantial changes in, to the CBD has greatly diminished. Um, the demolition of industrial buildings on the riverfront at South Bank for Expo 88 made more conspicuous the Riverside Expressway, which had been completed on the opposite bank a decade earlier. Its prominence in views from Expo promoted conflicting messages of progress on the one hand and irresponsible, in, irresponsibility on the other. Despite pre precedence for the removal of expressways, the Riverside Expressway is so inextricably bound with Brisbane CBD that its removal is unrealistic while a dependence on motor vehicles persists. Suggestions for its relocation to tunnels below the river are not feasible. The high riverbank, which made its design workable, would necessitate unacceptable grades to connect to the city grid, even if the construction of access and egress tunnels was possible without its prior demolition. For those seeking to reduce its dominance, the only idea left was to partially fill the river to create sites for buildings to hide it. <laughs> Officially, construction of the Riverside Expressway was seen as an unfortunate mistake. 
Between 2001 and 2008, $5 million was spent on the North Bank redevelopment, but apparently without serious concern for context or impacts. If there was any benefit in, in hiding the expressway, it accrued only to South Bank. Improvements in access were unproven, concerns over air quality and noise were dismissed, as were climatic disadvantages of overshadowing and exposure. Space for maintaining the expressway was an issue, especially following a structural scare in 2006, which caused the expressway to be temporarily closed. Regarding flood impacts, it seemed officially that filling the river might have actually had no impact. Um, the significance of some affected buildings was well known, but less well understood was the significance of North Bank as a whole. As for the Riverside Expressway itself, apart from its so-called misfortune of its construction, not much was said. Peter Skinner, the most effective opponent of North Bank, argued that with hindsight this was clearly a dreadful planning decision and to many people the expressway remain, structure remains an eyesore. The Deputy Premier and Minister for Infrastructure and Development, Paul Lucas, said, this part of the river is an unsightly mess. Building the Riverside Expressway 40 years ago was an act of urban environmental vandalism up there with bulldozing of Cloudland and the Bellevue Hotel. This official position was sorted by, uh, supported by pro-development lobbyists in the local press. It was left up to occasional correspondence to the press and critics of North Bank to question this orthodoxy. From north to south, the two-kilometre-long two expressway as the, main, is the main, as the main approach to the CBD from the south comprises a viaduct, section C to G. I'm going to take a while. Uh, C to G runs through to the Captain Cook Bridge then the Captain Cook Bridge, and then sections A and B run through to Woolloongabba. Um, built concurrently and overlapping the expressway was a new Victoria Bridge. The construction authority for the expressway and both bridges was the Coordinated General's Department. A similar but, similar but dual, dual level viaduct, the Petrie Bight Expressway along the town reach of the river on the opposite side of the CBD, was intended to fulfil a similar role for traffic from the north. Most of the Petrie Bite Expressway and later stages of the transportation study did not proceed. I want to talk now about just the history of transportation planning in Brisbane. Uh, responsibility for um, main roads in Queensland oscillated between the colonial or state government and road trusts or local government. In 1920, a main roads board was formed to provide financial assistance to local authorities for work on gazetted roads between towns. Roads within towns, however, remained the responsibility of local authorities until the 1960s. This, the apparent rigidity of this separation concealed an otherwise close association between state and local authorities through J.R. Kemp, the Commissioner for Main Roads. In 1932, William Forgan Smith's Labor government established the Bureau of Industry in which there was a Roads, Mining and General Works Committee. This committee advised all state government departments on capital works and initiated planning to reduce unemployment during the Depression. In 1938, the committee became the Office of the Coordinator General, a position first filled by Kemp, who was also, who was also Commissioner of Main Roads, which maintained the close association between the two agencies. The Coordinator General was able to co-opt any state official and by arrangement any local government engineer whose services might be required. His power was further increased in 1940 to include authority to construct works for both state and local authorities. The office prepared an annual coordinated plan of works for all state departments and local authorities. The coordinator general became the most powerful public official in Queensland. These arrangements served well during the Second World War when Kemp was also the deputy director of Allied Works. In 1950, engineering staff within the Bureau were amalgamated under the engineer James Holt, who succeeded Kemp as coordinator general in 1954. The engineering branch of the Coordinator General became an elite organisation. As a separate government department from 1951, Main Roads also attracted talented staff through student scholarships at both the University of Queensland and the Central Technical College. Graduates included the engineers Sidney Schubert and Eric Finger. Under Charles Barton as Commissioner of Main Roads from 1960, the position of Chief Engineer was split between the Construction and Maintenance Section and the Section for Research and Planning. This latter section was, position was occupied by Schubert, who had completed a postgraduate highway and traffic diploma at Durham University. In 1963, Eric Finger completed a Master of Technology degree in traffic engineering at the University of New South Wales, and that university was the leading uh, tertiary institution in this area in Australia. 
The Brisbane River um, was a, a natural and commercial asset, but its width, meandering course and high surrounds restricted access. Did I jump over to? Sorry. Uh, within this naturally defensible site, and you can see here the, the boundary of steep hills around the north and then the, the width... Oh, dear, sorry. Uh, the width of the river um, obstructed access on the, the, the other two main sides of the peninsula. Um, access from the northwest was easy, but from downstream through Petrie Bight, access was cut, um, cut um, into the steep riverbank. And you can see here the, the track sort of just narrow, inching along the narrow edge of that bank. Um, despite extensive earth moving over the years, and this area has been transformed, Spring Hill and Duncan's Hills remained obstructions for, for a long time. Bridge building was constrained by costs and clearance for shipping until the 1960s. In 1890, the only bridge was congested, but neither the Brisbane nor South Brisbane councils um, could afford another bridge. The collapse of the Victoria Bridge in floods in 1893 precluded any action other than its uh, urgent replacement. Um, in 19, um, uh, these are the main stages I'll, I'll go through, so um, we'll cover that, but it's that 45-year period from 1925. Um, in 1925, the recently inaugurated Greater Brisbane Council appointed a cross-river commission to advise on a new bridge. Chaired by Roger Hawken, the Professor of Civil Engineering, their report was Brisbane's first transportation plan. Despite its title, the Commission's concerns were wide-ranging. Ranging. And I put in this slide, just so I think it's so funny. Um, um, you can see push bicycles and motorcycle bicycles, but also light horses and heavy horses. <laughs> uh, uh, and it was to do with a table of the, the, the um, economic loss by delays in steep grades in roads. So they went around and checked all of this and worked out times and things. But it was thoroughly comprehensive. There were lots of these tables. Um, um, the recommendations included 12 bridges um, in order of priority, a shipping and flood mitigation ca canal through Kangaroo Point. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but this was a canal cut through the base of the point. Um, um, a two-level traffic circus at Petrie Bight, um, uh, which is up here. Um, and road tunnels into the Fortitude Valley um, that aren't shown on this diagram, and a tram tunnel through to Wollongabba, which is, this was a tram tunnel, and I might say there are other tunnels considered as well. Uh, they called them tubes um, in the report. Um, uh, the, um, this is just a, a di oh, dear, I'm so clumsy. Um, this is a diagram of that canal through um, Kangaroo Point. And if you're surprised that it's going through the absolute peak, the top highest level in the point, that was to do with um, trying to get shipping access um, um, through the, through the um, canal at most times, but not all times. And there was a bascule bridge across here. But that enabled, and this is a typical bascule bridge in Chicago, where there are, I don't know whether any, you, any of you have been there, but there are lots. They're absolutely fabulous. <laughs> um, and, and they're quite late. I mean, this was quite contemporary. Um, the 1925 st six study um, compared to these, this one that was built in Chicago in 1929. But um, 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 the, the main recommendation, um, um, well, the first priority was a two-deck, two-level bridge, um, a low-level bridge from Kangaroo Point to Petrie Bight, and that's this bridge across here, not in the present possession, but went through to this traffic circus that I'll show in a later slide. But these were the diagrams illustrating the impact of building a new bridge on the traffic density that was currently concentrated on the Victoria Bridge. But you can see that it made a sort of con point of congestion here and a secondary one there that persisted for a long time and influenced the much later studies. This was a detail of the, um, the, two, the, um, the traffic circuit. It, it's at two levels and the bridge is at two levels. So it goes over a, a low-level road here, then under the, under the main traffic circuit through to Petrie Bight. So you can see it's making a whole lot of links between streets and trying to extend the CBD grid through into the valley. And these are subways underneath um, All Hallows and in Ivory Street to connect into the lower sections of the, of the valley. And these sort of plans for um, um, tunnels and viaducts and things here became a, a major uh, part of most later proposals. Um, the, the top um, illustration is a diagram of the two-level bridge coming from Kangaroo Point on the left to, um, to the city. So you can see there are underpasses here and then it goes across to the right through the circus. Um, the bottom one, the, among the other bridges, was this transporter bridge um, that was to go from Barton Street, Balmoral, to Chermside Street in Tenerife. 
and that was for trams and cars and pedestrians that would hop into this cage and be transported across the bridge. And its high level, of course, was for shipping clearance on that bridge. And it was one of only two in the, in the, in the report, in the recommendations. Um, um, the talented engineer George Bolton directed support staff of the study. Consultants included Julius Poole and Gibson for ferries to carry trams, vehicles and pedestrians. A. Harding Frew uh, for, for a bascule bridge over Kangaroo Point that I mentioned, as well as this tra the transporter bridge um, um, for trams, vehicles and pedestrians. E. B. Cullen for wharves to replace those upstream if if access was blocked by low-level bridge, Evans Deacon for the tubes or tunnels for trams and vehicles, and Walter Doak, the bridge engineer for the railways department for a high-level bridge between Bowen Terrace and Kangaroo Point, which was designed in collaboration with Hawkins students at the University of Queensland. This is just an example of one of those transporter bridges that still operates at Mil uh, Middlesbrough in England. Um, um, as writers to the report, um, there were three members of the commission. The third one was um, R. Martin Wilson, an engineer and architect, and he put a rider into the study. And this is an extraordinary vision for Brisbane as a sort of manufacturing megalopolis. Um, it's the whole of New Farm has turned into this extraordinary manufacturing area. So these dotted lines are all railway lines <laughs> going into factories, uh, most of Bulimba, but there are docks built into Newstead at right angles to the river and a lot of docks down here at the mouth of the river. But it's, it was so as the whole of you know, Montague Road was turned into man, the manufacturing area which it became. But it's an extraordinary vision of um, what Brisbane might have been. Um, he also has this, which interests me because I've always, um, sorry, like the Cross River links. And he was proposing links that started connecting across the peninsulas. And I think that's still a very valid idea. This is moderately clumsy but made very difficult by trying to maintain high level access. So he's creeping up onto hills here to get a high level bridge across to um, um, Hawthorne or further downstream. Um, the report, the, the Commission's report was reviewed by the Council's pioneering town planner, John William Earl, and he was the first town planner employed by a local authority in Australia. Earl proposed bridges at Grey Street um, here um, and at East Brisbane here. This was another one of these transporter bridges, um, which were the second and fourth of the, in the Commission's recommendations as part of making a, a ring road right around the, the, the inner city. And you'll recognise bits of it, like Gilchrist Avenue that was built through um, what was Victoria Park at this time and, and um, is now the inner city bypass. Um, I mean, I must say I prefer the Gilchrist Avenue. But, um, um, Earl, um, um, these um, two new bridges made possible the replacement of the Victoria Bridge, which um, um, was overloaded and had some structural problems. Um, Earl revived the rejected proposal from the Railways Department for linking railways on the north and south banks of the river by a double-decker bridge with road vehicles below and trams above, trams and trains above. So this was a two-level bridge, picked up the railway line, it went at a high level round into Roma Street. Um, um, Earl envisaged New Farm again, like um, uh, Martin Wilson, R. Martin Wilson, as the major um, commercial district for the city, and he connected it with a new low-level road that ran around the riverbank below the cliffs into the CBD, into the CBD. Without government support, the Commission's two-level uh, bridge and shipping canal at Kangaroo Point were deferred in favour of the Grey Street Bridge, completed in 1932. Um, as a single level bridge by Harding Frew, was built by Manuel Hornibrook and, Hornibrook and Bolton, um, who was on the study, acted as chief engineer. Despite the rejection of uh, the high level bridge designed by Doak for the commission being rejected, the idea persisted and in 1930, Doak revised his estimate when a franchise proposal for a high level bridge was received from the English steel manufacturer Dorman Long, and they were at that time contractors for the Sydney Harbour Bridge. The, the, the submission was rejected. Um, but new balanced cantilever the variations of Doak's design were made for a bridge between St, um, Kangaroo Point and Centenary Place or, and or Bowen Terrace um, were made in 1931. But, before, but shortly before a decision was taken to proceed with a bridge to Bowen Terrace, which had less impact on existing development. For erection of the bridge, talented engineers who'd worked on the Harbour Bridge in Sydney moved to Brisbane, including JJC Bradfield, who was appointed consulting engineer, James Holt and John Kindler. Humphrey Bramold, another engineer who is important in this story, also came from Sydney, but he, hadn't, he wasn't a, an employee on the Harbour Bridge. 
Bradfield rejected a suspension bridge which was being considered when he arrived, preferring Doak Steel Trust Cantilever, um, a form that he'd initially favoured for the Sydney Harbour Bridge. But by now he was more influenced by one in Montreal that was recently um, completed, the South Shore Bridge. Um, apart from the idea for the, um, the structural ideas, maybe little, little else came from overseas for the Story Bridge. Construction was by the Brisbane contractors Evans, Deak and Hornibrook using Australian-made steel. The bridge opened on the 6th of July 1940 and remains Australia's longest trust, steel trust bridge. Holt, Kindler and Bramall stayed in Queensland and after the war occupied key positions in the Coordinator General's office. When the bridge board of the Bureau of Industry became part of the COG's office in 1947, Humphrey Bramall became leader of the bridge group with responsibility for major steel bridges, including the Fitzroy and Burdekin River bridge, bridges. Labor difficulties and long delays in, in, the, after, in the, the days after the war um, with obtain, uh, delays with obtaining steel led to later preferring pre-stressed concrete as a material for bridges. Completion of the Story Bridge did little to alleviate Brisbane's traffic congestion. In, in October 1944, a committee of the Department of Transport again considered ways of improving the situation. Their recommendations late in 1945 were less far-reaching than earlier proposals, but included an underpass below the Victoria Bridge through to Margaret Street and a viaduct along the town reach linking Elizabeth Street through to the valley. Little, little eventuated, but congestion in, increased. In 1947, plans for undergrounding trams were revived, and that was an aspect of the original commission's work, but applied in this case at Petrie Bight as the first stage to underground trams throughout the CBD. This was an unusual. Washington, um, um, D.C., had underground trams, um, and, and we follow a close pattern. They opted eventually for an underground when we went for the freeway, um, which maybe was smarter, but... Um, um, uh, it was the start of a plan to underground trams throughout the CBD. It was a new version of the earlier two-level circus. Road changes included an eastern bypass as a viaduct along the river and into Val Valley via Ivory Street were included when this proposal to underground trams was approved. This is a plan of, um, of Petrie Bight area in 1949 and you can see these are the lead-ins to the tunnels that trams dropped down and went, um, went underneath through the underground and rose up to ground level again at the beginning of Queen Street. But there are also road tunnels. This is the viaduct through across to Ivory Street and a tunnel through there and then another under, uh, under what became Kemp Place and then, then another tunnel through to the lower areas of Valley. But it was also seeking ways of improving access from the CBD through to Barry Parade and to the north. Um, I lose my place. Um, Um, after this proposal was fully documented, but the implementation was delayed by prolonged post-war shortages of technical staff and materials, and eventually it was abandoned. In the 1950s, the ideas were taken up by all successors at the Council, Frank Costello and A.A. Heath, the Victoria Bridge underpass on the South Brisbane Reef and Reach and the vi bypass viaduct on the Town Reach continued to Gardens Point and were, became part of an inner-city ring road. Um, uh, you can see here the viaducts coming along that side and they continued right down to Gardens Point and then back around that other side. But there are all sorts of interesting proposals here. This is the State Library in 1959 and you can see, not very distinctly, the viaduct running right along the riverbank there. Between 1941 and 61, Brisbane's population doubled and vehicle registrations increased rapidly. Meanwhile, the policies for funding urban roads established in the 1920s remained unchanged. In 1954, similar problems in the United States led to the formation of a National Committee on Urban Transportation to collect data and to promote transportation planning. In 1958, that committee published their findings in a set of manuals which were used in Queensland. In 1957, the government sought advice from an American traffic engineer, Wilbur S. Smith, and soon afterwards, the Traffic Commission was established in the Coordinator General's Department. In 1958-9, Kenneth Leach, a traffic engineer, again promoted the underpasses to reduce congestion at the northern abutment of the Victoria Bridge and argued that an arterial road network should be developed for Brisbane. An interim plan for, this art for arterial roads was produced in 1963 and it included both the inner ring road and, and the um, radial um, uh, roads. But until a tr comprehensive traffic study was undertaking, the city 
was denied classification in a Queensland Roads Plan gazetted in 1963, and that limited their access to funds uh, for, for um, urban roads. It was decided in January 1964 that a transportation study would be undertaken. Uh, um, oh, sorry, that was the plan of the radial roads and the, and the ring road. I've blown up a bit of it just to show the ring road that went right around the river at the point and then up through round, round the valley following um, Earl's earlier plan. The transportation study was undertaken, as I've said, in a period of optimism and prosperity. With Brisbane's population set to reach one million by 1981, the coffers of the main roads department were overflowing as motor vehicle registrations increased rapidly. They had, they had kind of um, discretionary use of the funds that they got from registration, so they were very well off <laughs> as a government department. Um, to handle work, a large modern office building was commissioned. The department's commitment to change and innovation was reflected in the appointment of the avant-garde emigre architect Carl Langer for its design. To complete the plan quickly, an international consultant was appointed, Wilbur Smith and Associates, an American firm with wide experience who'd recently been retained for similar surveys in Melbourne and Hobart. But I might say on this score, Brisbane was kind of at the leading edge of this in, as regards Australia. The studies here were more comprehensive and, and, and more elaborate. The Brisbane Transportation Study was overseen by a committee drawn from the Departments of Main Roads, Railways and Transport and the Newtown Planning Section of the Brisbane City Council. Members included Sidney Schubert, um, Eric Finger um, and L.V. Guthrie of the Brisbane City Council. They were the main, three main bureaucrats. And the study was directed by James E. Hamm of Wilbur Smith & Associates. A citizens committee in, ensured that there was widespread knowledge of the issues and the work of the, of the team which would facilitate acceptance of the study. Progress was reviewed by a subcommittee comprising Ham, Guthrie, um, Schubert, Guthrie and Finger. Concurrently, an, a, a parking study of the CBD was also undertaken by Wilbur Smith and Associates. The plan was completed in August 1965, but the um, publication was delayed until December that year while they worked out how it related to the Brisbane Town Plan. Recommend, I mean, they've all been taken into account, but the plan had never been gazetted. I mean, despite all that earlier work for a town plan in Brisbane, one, one never eventuated until 1965. It was just coming to fruition at the, when the, the freeway work was being done. Uh, recommendations include an inner city re ring road, the central freeway. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no. I keep jumping. To, oh, no. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, our recommendations include an inner city ring road, the central um, freeway, expressways into the CBD from the south and northwest, the Riverside Expressway, and the north, the Wharf Street Extension, the northeast, the Petrie Bight Expressway, and the east, the Story Bridge Expressway. Radial freeways um, to, to all directions of the compass. Um, an eastern bypass, the north south freeway, five new bridges over the river, upgrades of existing roads in the CBD, including the systematic introduction of one way streets in couplets, the extension of Turbot Street through to Boundary Street, Creed Street to Turbot Street, and Wharf Street through to the Central Freeway. A new transportation centre at Central Station and additional parking, as well as the abandonment of trams. The estimated cost was 169 million, which was considered economically feasible. The study became known as the Wilbur Smith Plan, though few of the ideas were new. The plan was to be implemented in four five-year plans between 1965 and 1985. Um, that's the Riverside Expressway from the thing. The, plan, the, the presentation of the plan was very sophisticated with aerial photographs and um, plans superimposed uh, over them. And, um, um, this was just a comparison between the plans that existed before the Wilbur Smith plan and the Wilbur Smith plan, the pinks, the earlier work. But you can see there's a very close um, relationship between them, except for this strange one, which I know nothing about. Um, <laughs> it must have come about just in 1964, just at the time the council must have been thinking about it, just when the plans to do the study were undertaken. And so um, I, I didn't pick it up in the work I've done. Uh, the implement, uh, work started at once on stage one, um, 1965 to 70, which included the Riverside, Story Bridge and Petrie Bight Expressways, parts of the South East and Central Freeways, the extension of Creek and Turbot Streets and the conversion of streets to one way, replacement of trams and tr trolley buses, parking and a new Victoria Bridge. I mean, not all of Stage 1 was implemented, of course. Um, um, while the Riverside Expressway has been reviled, its close relative, the Victoria Bridge, has been applauded. Both were designed in the Coordinator General's office at about the same time and have comparable aesthetic intentions. The first Victoria Bridge was a temporary timber bridge built in 1965 to serve while the construct 
while a permanent, first permanent bridge was constructed. Um, it opened in 19, 1874. After floods destroyed half in 1893, it was replaced by a hogback trust bridge, which opened in 1897. By the 1920s, overloading and a lack of maintenance provoked the Cross River Commission to recommend that it be replaced. Repairs to the Victoria Bridge were undertaken in 1943, uh, were undertaken, but in 1943, two university students demonstrated that the bridge was 60% overstressed. In 1949, when the Coordinator General General confirmed their calculations. It showed that the bridge should have already fallen down. <laughs> um, but remedial measures were ch taken while the council designed a replacement. And um, the council design of 1957 was an arched concrete box skirt, a bridge of seven spans with underpasses at each end, similar to London's Waterloo Bridge on the left-hand side there. The coordinator general suggested it would be cheaper to use steel or pre-stressed concrete. Pre-stressed concrete bridges... Um, um, Pre-stressed concrete for bridges had advanced quickly after the war, particularly in Germany, where replacement of bridges provided opportunities for experimentation. There were a vast number of bridges built, um, so it was fantastic times uh, um, for engineers. Before tenders could be called for all options, tests showed that no det further deterioration had occurred and that with reduced loading and careful maintenance, it should last. With the introduction of one-way traffic in Anne and Elizabeth Streets, now the first two streets to be made one way in Brisbane, and synchronised lights, neither the underpass nor a wider bridge was immediately necessary. But further deterioration occurred and load, the load restrictions, which tried to limit one tram per, per span, proved hard to administer. A decision was taken in 1964 to build a new bridge designed by the Coordinator General. Balanced cantilever construction, either precast or in situ, further enhanced the structural performance and economy of pre-stressed concrete, culminating in, in um, Ulrich Finsterwalder's Bendorf Bridge over the Rhine. And uh, Finsterwalder was the great um, um, engineer for pre-stressed box girder bridges. Um, and that's his bridge at the top. Um, the comparable Medway Bridge, the bigger image, in England, designed by Freeman Fox, also influenced the design of H.G. Bramald and Albert Contessa. The British were enormously proud of this bridge in their films and publications scattered all over the world. Um, there's one at the National Film Library um, about it. The first bridge was similar. The, the, their first bridge was similar to the council designs with four lanes for traffic and two lanes for trams with an underpass at the city end and grade separation in South Brisbane. <coughs> to avoid the existing bridge and its predecessor's debris still on the riverbed, it was decided to build instead a three-span pre-stressed concrete bridge upstream. With the design well adva advanced, advice was received that the Brisbane Transportation Study then underway would recommend the abolition of trams and the construction of a new bridge at Gardens Point, which would relegate the Victoria Bridge to local traffic only. The possibility that the existing bridge might fall before the Garden Bridge was completed provoked a decision to proceed immediately with it, but with the width reduced to four lanes, um, with trams occupying two of these, should their use continue, despite the recommendation of the transportation study. When tenders were called, alternative designs were permitted, but there was a strong preference which was indicated for the Coordinator General's official design. In any case... Um, um, pier locations clear of the debris and flood, and, 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 and flood clearances uh, made, made an economical design in steel difficult. Architectural advice was sought for um, aesthetic decisions. The consultant was Stuart McIntosh, best re um, remembered for the ES&A banks in Melbourne, Canberra and Darwin. And he came to Brisbane after winning a competition for the Great Hall at the University of Queensland with a structurally adventurous design. When tenders exceeded available funds, the project was abandoned. But like the Victoria Bridge, the construction authority for the Great Hall and for the University of Queensland generally was the coordinator general. Um, for Macintosh, the broad design parameters were already in place. The main piers of the bridge were of different heights and both were short due to the depth of the box girder. To improve the proportions of the piers, the initial idea was to carry up the cutwaters over the external face of the girders as had been done at the Bendorf Bridge. And I've inserted a detail so that this is the cutwater on the leading edge of the piers and that was extended over the girder, um, the bridge girder. This was not favoured as it contradicted the basic structural form by crossing the hinge of the bridge as well as interrupting the continuity of the girder. Macintosh drew numerous variations before arriving at the, at the final form with a chamfer at the top of the angular cutwash to the battered piers. 
Um, and these drawings survive at the, uh, they're out in Friar at the University of Queensland. There's a, he, there are four or five variations he did of the, of the different um, options. And I mean, for di people who aren't designers here, you can spend an enormous amount of time just playing around with what is quite a small detail. And the Macintosh thing looks almost self-evident, but it, believe me, it wouldn't have been initially. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's quite, it's a nice solution. Um, uh, Anyway, to, um, ma um, to emphasise the, um, the um, sh continuity of the road deck, Macintosh increased its vis visible depth. He also selected the colour scheme and advised on the lighting. The bridge was immediately popular and has remained so, unlike the Riverside Expressway. Um, of the proposed freeways, the first major section to be built was the Riverside Expressway. Detailed design commenced in June 1964 and the, freeway, the expressway was completed in 1974. Geometrical constraints were grade-separated connections to six city streets, clearing both the proposed and existing Victoria Bridge, avoiding a coaxial cable crossing of the river, maintaining access at least to Ulla Street in floods, and mi minimising the encroachments to reduce impacts for navigation as well as flood runoff. The original alignment was based on, on an approach to the Captain Cook Bridge being on filled embankments. Um, this was found not to be feasible due to excessive settlement at Gardens Point and it proved necessary to use viaducts for the entire expressway. This allowed realignment of the, of the road which avoided a recently completed morgue, another interest of mine. Uh, but in doing so, the river crossing at Garden Point was considerably skewed. Um, this was the, um, the original um, alignment and you can see it here, crossing Gardens Point there but eventually it came right along the river edge and crossed the river at an angle, and they refer to those as skewed bridges. Um, um, the layout of the expressway was reviewed by B.L. Andrews of Wilbur Smith and Associates in 1967, which led to the rationalising of the off and off, on and off ramps. In a kilometre and a half between Alice and Turbot Streets, there are four on and five off ramps, six of which turn through 90 degrees, at a radius of 36 metres while crossing over or under the freeway, the river and other roads. The changes eliminated weaving manoeuvres, increased the lengths for acceleration or deceleration and as well as storage. I mean, just parking while you're waiting to get off the freeway. Um, relocate, relocated to the left-hand side as far as possible, ramps exiting the through road. Changed the parapet design and increased the width of breakdown lanes. Following the review and the changes in geometry was found necessary to replace the previously intended spans with a uniform span of 110 metres. These changes were very good. I mean, it was very skillful review. And it's meant that the freeway has worked, I think, extremely well for a very long time. The, 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 those changes they made have been, uh, been surprisingly good. Um, I'll talk a bit now about... Oh, sorry, jumped. I'll talk a bit about some of the details of the Riverside Expressway. I mean, I guess this is the core of it, but, but I'm going on a bit, aren't I? Um, I've got a fair way through. The geometry was resolved with a three-dimensional Cartesian grid. Like, it's a highly complex three-dimensional um, st um, um, structure with the coordinates calculated using programs developed by the program team for the Queensland Government's first computer. This happened all at the time when computers were first coming in. Up until that time, all this work, the calculations would have been done manually. and things. So the computers just came in at a time when they could start using them. But the programs aren't available in the way they are to us. They had to develop their own programs to do the job they wanted and had the computing capacity but not the programs so that the team involved developed programs that would um, satisfy their needs. Without this technology, it would have not have been possible to undertake the geometrical computations in what was the first major application in Australia of what's called Ural spir Euler spiral transitioning, which is to do with the acceleration and deceleration on curves to get an even um, geometry that, um, that suits um, the, the movement of traffic. Um, previously, the onerous calculations made its use out of the question. The design of the section north of Albert Street was by the structure section of the Coordinated General's Department, which in June 1970 became the special project section of Main Roads Department. And the designers of the expressway were Humphrey Brammeld and John Gralton. Um, the use of curve box, box, curve box girders was sufficiently new, again, for them to devise their own methodology for designing uh, um, curved bridges, and as well as computer programs which were developed to analyse bending and torsional stiffness. 
Precedents overseas include the Mancunian Way, an elevated roadway in Manchester, which they mention in, as a, an influence. The section between the Gardens Point Bridge and Ulster Street was designed according to the same standards by the consultant Cameron McNamara, and Ian Cameron, who's still alive, was a sort of major opponent to North Bank, who was also responsible for the sections A and B south of the Captain Cook Bridge. To achieve the long spans without restraint re required for the curved on and off ramps, torsionally stiff curved box garter, um, girders were ca cast in situ were used, but for typical roadways with a, con with a consistent span of 110 feet, simply supported post-tensioned U and I beams were used. The top flange of the I beams formed part of the otherwise in situ road deck. Geometrical irregularity in the plan uh, um, 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 using standard sections was taken up by tapers in the in situ concrete headstocks, thereby maintaining a standard span which facilitated the economics of pre-casting. Concrete crash barriers throughout were standard General Motors design incorporating guardrails, drainage and services. Raking abutments to the, to the on and off ramps incorporated major service installations and were uniformly clad in rock face concrete masonry which was then pretty new and which had been used on the Victoria Bridge. Um, Given the recent demonising of the Riverside Expressway on visual grounds, the careful consideration which was given to aesthetic aspects of the design is ironic, as outlined when the design was published. Close attention has been paid to the aesthetic implications of the various decisions taken in the geometric design of the expressway. The aesthetic quality of the structure and its setting were in like manner regarded as of utmost importance. The guiding principles were simplicity and structural honesty, and considerable care was taken to minimise obstruction of river views. An attempt was made at some expense to remove all projections and appurtenances which could interrupt the flowing lines of the superstructure. Um, circular columns rising straight from the river concealed below their, below their waterline a substructure of board piles and pile caps. Um, this, in addition to the aesthetic merit of this decision, it also had the functional advantage in equally satisfying the varied f directions of forces on the columns coming from the flow in the river. Um, um, as well as minimising their capacity to snag debris. Um, likewise, the integration of headstocks with an inverted T-section within a consistent five-foot structural depth throughout the expressway um, is visually attractive but com uh, constructionally quite complex. The functional advantage was that the headstocks would not intrude into the available height clearance for the on and off ramps above or below the through road, while also increasing the height of space below for pedestrian access to the river. A consistent external appearance as achieved by the use of pre-stressed box girders for curve ramps and formerly comparable post-tensioned U-beams for the external face of the standard sections of the roadway. Um, I'm sorry, that all sounds pretty uh, difficult, but it, it's quite clever that, that they make, maintain this constant five-foot depth and it, it's achieved by a variety of different structural solutions of box girders with more than one cell or, or U-beams that eventually became a box girder when the in-situ road deck was poured or I-beams that um, um, sub, uh, were an economical um, solution for, the, for the, the main through road. But they all have this consistent depth, so it gave a simplicity that um, um, was to them highly attractive. I mean, I might say currently that's not regarded so highly, but there is still great merit in, in these decisions, I think, not least the question of flood debris and keeping the pile caps below the waterline, like since that time everything has ended up with a very ugly um, pile cap above the waterline. You can see on all the new bridges now we've got a whole succession of islands in the river which if we ever do have a flood will be a problem. Um, uh, but you can see the, the, the headstocks here are, are an inverted T and the precast beams come in and sit on them. And so that's a decision taken with economic um, um, repercussions but it, it, it gave all sorts of benefits by tightening the section down of the whole freeway so it generally drops below the plane of the city which is on this elevated bank. So it's a whole lot of quite clever decisions designed to achieve what they um, a, a good looking road with good functional performances in terms of views and access. Um, um, uh, I'll jump on a bit. Um, um, I'd
contradicting the present neglect of space under the freeway, close attention was paid to enhancing its appearance and making the riverbank publicly accessible for the first time in more than a century. I mean, this was an industrial area. It certainly wasn't accessible in any normal way uh, uh, until the freeway was built. Um, a hand-placed rock wall was constructed for the full length of the fore foreshore below the expressway. And existing trees were retained and the riverbank were planted by landscape architects of the Works Department. Integral with the Riverside Expressway and its largest individual structure was the Gardens Point, now Captain Cook Bridge. It was designed by the Coordinated General's Department and comprises two separate bridges adjacent. Um, when it was built, it was the largest, the, the, the largest span within the bridge was the third largest concrete um, pre-stressed bridge in the world. Located on a bend in the river, the piers also resist flood forces in transverse and longitudinal directions. Um, when the design tenders were called, seven of the 15 were for alternative designs. Deficiencies justified their rejection and the lowest price of 5.3 million for the official design from Transfield, Queensland was accepted. And this um, question of alternative designs and official designs is important. It was at a time when the government would go for other than the lowest price to achieve a better quality or more durability. I mean, a lot of the alternatives were steel, which would have had a major maintenance problem, despite that freeway problem I mentioned in brief, which I suspect wasn't such a problem. They proved very dur durable and low maintenance elements, and um, the steel ones would have been a monument, would be a major uh, maintenance problem for the government. But I mean, that, that situation later changed. Construction of the bridge began in 1968. The balance cantilever started with a box centred over a pier with one on each side supported by false work. And although these things seem quite minor now, getting rid of this false work here, I mean, this is a major achievement anyway, to only have that amount of um, scaffolding to build a major bridge. But getting rid of it altogether was a sort of um, the next stage. Um, um, uh, Stuart McIntosh was again the architectural consultant but had fewer opportunities. The elegant angular cutwash of the Victoria Bridge made no sense where the, where the crossing itself was skewed and accordingly the rectangular piers of the bridge effectively are an angular cutwash. By the 1980s, um, concrete box girders were the most popular form for major bridges and with the building of two such bridges in quick succe succession, the bridge group of the main roads department was an office of world standing. Two more concrete box girder bridges designed for the transportation studies show further advances in the work of the section. The New Farm Bridge 1974 was abandoned when the Central Freeway did not proceed and for the privately funded Gateway Bridge, the contractor built a proven alternative rather than the department's official but untried design. Both bridges, um, uh, two bridges that had originally been proposed for the New Farm Peninsula, so I've shown, both were transporter bridges. When the ra radius of the inner ring road was increased in the transportation study, this, the two bridges were replaced by a single bridge downstream. But when the central freeway was documented, and all, a lot of this work was documented even though it didn't go ahead, the location of the New Farm Bridge moved again to take advantage of a high bank at Norman Park. I've lost my, my illustration of this, but this is a bridge built a, uh, more than a decade later in El Porto in Spain, which... Um, 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 has the, the key elements, which was the reconsideration of the, the structure there. And although this is all the box go girder bridge and very similar to the others, it really becomes almost a frame with the pier and the, and the girders tied tightly together. And this meant that this could be made in situ with the start of the, um, the balanced cantilever construction on both sides. Previously, when the pier was quite small, you needed to put in some um, scaffolding to prop it up but with a larger mass there and things they were able to do with no scaffolding at all. Um, the, the, the square piers here at New Farm were required um, in case uh, uh, ships collided. The bridge there needed to be sufficiently high so that they could get partially completed ships out from the Kangaroo Point dockyard. The, lower, the gateway bridge has a, a, a much more protracted history. The 1926 Commission identified a need for the bridge or a tunnel there. World War II stimulated development, making it more useful. 1964 tenders were called for a privately funded toll bridge, but none were received. And then following the publication of the transportation plan with, an, with its eastern bypass road, the north-south freeway, a feasibility study was undertaken by Wilbur Smith and Associates. Tenders were recalled in 1966, but again unsuccessfully. Then after a downriver transportation study was carried out by Rankin Hill in 1969, planning resumed in the 1970s on the Gateway Motorway. The bridge constraints here were a wide 55 metre high clearance, shipping clearance 
and a maximum height for the bridge imposed by flight paths from the nearby airport. This left a narrow band which precluded arched or cable stayed bridges. With confidence from their recent successes upstream in the yet to be abandoned New Farm Bridge, a further development of pre-stressed uh, box girder bridges was devised and has become known as a finback bridge. Instead of the box girders being below the road, the balanced cantilever structure took the form of an inverted T forming a, a longitudinal tapered fin with its, ma with its maxim maximum height occurring above the bridge piers. Somewhat self-consciously, 17th of October 1973 was regarded as the date of the earliest sketches by John Grolton of the Main Roads Department and his design became the department's official design when tenders were called. At, and, and it's interesting, it's to do with the kind of evolution of the idea and he's putting in his claim for, for being original. And I might say at this time, bridge design is mostly evolutionary, not revolutionary. And it's people building gradually on experience and, and developing ideas so that they're not so much kind of original uh, freak shows as, 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 as a sensible advance on something that goes before. Um, 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 at the time, two related designs had been in completed in Germany in 1970 and 1973, just ahead of it, uh, both by both for the work of Ulrich Finsterwalder. It is not known if Grolton was aware of these designs but both were very significantly smaller than the 260 metre span required for Brisbane, which made it the longest box girder bridge in the world. Um, this is a design there. You can see the ta tapered fins above. That's the profile of the Brisbane Bridge. And this is the shipping clearance that took all of that. It needed a big rectangular space underneath. And if you had a typical earlier one of the box girder bridges, the, the gradually increasing depth of the girder pushed the whole bridge further up. And that's why the gateway bridge now is so high. It's built in the... Um, in, in, in the traditional way rather than to this design. This had the very great merit of dropping the whole deck much lower so that the approach roads were much reduced. Inherently, it was a vastly sensible and economical design. Its great failing was it was untried. It was a, it was a real advance on designs up until that time. And when they called tenders for a toll operation of the bridge, the contractor, of course, had much more say in what was built and he opted, Transfield, who won the tender, opted to build a version of the Captain Cook Bridge which they'd just built previously and which they knew would work rather than taking the chances with this. But it was a great shame because this would have been uh, an absolutely extraordinary bridge which would have um, established them as really the leaders in this field in the world. Um, the bottom one is, is just a, a sketch we did at work for a, 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 a very briefly lived pedest double pedestrian bridge. But you, think, you can see how neat the under, underneath is and the fins there above the top with the, with the structure of it. We, we had a paired one. You want me to stop? Yeah, OK. Um, well, the plan, the, 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 the plan around this time came to an end. There was a review done in 1974 of the freeway. Opposition was growing. For, um, funding for urban freeways was being cut by the, the federal government. Um, um, as Eric Finger wrote, stiff opposition to the so-called highway monster was to be found everywhere, so that it, it really ground to a halt at this time. I just briefly talked about some of the, just some of the impacts um, of of the fear. It was criticised for not um, for um, not concentrating on public transport. But three years later, they'll commission Wilbur Smith to do um, a public transport plan for Brisbane, and almost all the recommendations of this plan have been implemented, but it's completely forgotten. Um, it included, it was, it, again, the ideas were often not new, but again, the momentum of them putting it all together in a coherent plan was this catalyst for getting it accepted. Um, so the Merivale Bridge was one. They also had ideas for, for the urban lanes, which I quite like. It's now seen as a kind of hospitality opportunity. <laughs> but here it was to do with getting, act, getting goods delivered to buildings, which is no longer <laughs> something we worry about. <laughs> but, I mean, it was sort of, so they're trying to improve that. Um, it was interested in pedestrian circulation, so they plotted where there was cover and not cover, where there are arcades. It suggested extending the, the, that underground tunnel through the, um, the Wickham Terrace car park through to Astor Terrace, which was a nice idea to, to overcome that line. Um, it also had improved the access from Central Station, proposing raised walkways along Edward and Wall Street here, which later come back in Robin Gibson's plan for, for Anzac Square. Um, the most interesting thing in terms of current debate is their underground railway, and a complete underground railway was proposed, <laughs> and and it's a very nice plan, I think, um, <laughs> with stations uh, with one at um, Boundary Street, one under Queen Street at Wall Street, one near the top of Queen Street, 
T-junction there, one at Parliament, one at Turbot Speed. Um, the government got slightly nervous about this, although the costs were all OK. Um, it was all in the plan, and, and they brought in the GLC from London, who thought this was far too ambitious for a provincial um, city. And they did their own very horrible, ugly plan, um, which I think contributed to the whole idea dying. Um, but of course, they also um, uh, introduced one-way streets, are responsible for the removal of the trams, though their plan um, didn't really provide for that. It was quite possible for the trams to have been kept within the, the, um, the freeway plan, which was a nice thought that you might have had this localised network with trams and then the high-speed traffic thing, so they're not responsible for that. The car parks, King George Square, Anzac Square, and later Cathedral Square, all built as a result of the, fr uh, the freeway plan, the transportation plan uh, centre, uh, intended for a com um, um, central station, later built at Anzac, at uh, Roma Street. I don't think that can be held for the appalling form it later <laughs> took. Um, but that change there was when the government um, started losing confidence in the capacity of the bureaucracy to come up with good ideas, and they start doing design and construct tenders for all sorts of things. I mentioned a couple for the in the in the Down River Bridge, but they start calling tender. The, Romans, oh, sorry, the, the freeway plan was done at the time of the, when King George Square was considering being changed and people, there was a competition, ideas competition, which led to Arthur Bly um, doing his Bly plan for Roma Street. And the government commissioned him to do that and then called tenders on it but got no takers. And when that failed, then the, gov then the Treasury Department started saying, well, we can get people to build things if we just go to design and construct. And that leads to both the changes at Central Station and Roma Street and a whole lot of office buildings around Brisbane that are particularly ugly. <laughs> um, but in Sydney, I briefly looked at the significance of the freeway, and I think it can, it, you can support an argument for its heritage significance. These are the criteria for it, and I think it does come close to meeting them. That diagram illustrated a lot of those major impacts that it had on the centre of the town. It's certainly the best example and the earliest example of a freeway in Brisbane. It certainly has a strong association with this firm of engineers, and I think it's got a set of significance. Um, they're the kind of schedule of important bridges that this crew did, and as I say, they are world leaders. The work was also wonderfully published and things in all sorts of ways. They publish technical papers, they get higher degrees at the university by exploring the theoretical basis of the work that's being done. It's a, it's a great, um, it was a great time. Um, I put a couple of these in just the aesthetics exhibit. Peter Cook, he's a well-known, he's now Sir Peter Cook, an eminent English architect, came out here for a while and you can see, oh sorry, uh, which is that? Um, um, it's not terribly clear in this, but he did a, a whole, a, an art exhibition here with a whole lot of drawings based on the freeway and a high-rise house. He came back recently and the thing he wanted to see was if the pale green colouring on the feet of the freeway was still there. <laughs> you know, he remembered it all these years. But there are people who write letters to the paper and strongly support, and support of it. And I think, to many extent, I think the um, popularity of the freeway might date from North Bank rather than being a long-term one. <laughs> it's actually been induced in the community. So I think in many ways it's an, in, an interesting part of the, of, of the city. And I think, you know, for, just to finish, for Brisbane, I think we have to start working with what we have. We've got to like what we've got not hoping that an isolated icon will be our salvation. Thanks. <laughs>